So hi everybody, I'm Scott Stanchfield and we're going to talk about the observer design pattern today. Now normally what I do when I'm teaching this as a class, so I do something I call a pattern theater. And it's a little script that I pass out to everybody and I get people to come up and do a cold read of the script. Now I didn't know how many people were going to show up and we, we actually have fewer people than I needed roles. So what I decided to do is just do it kind of like a little PowerPoint presentation. Kind of get the same general idea across. The idea is to try to represent the pattern in real world terms first so that you can kind of get the concepts and then we can see how programs can implement something similar. So what we're going to talk about is Paul Revere's ride. And we start off with, you know, those, uh, hello. Those nasty British, they're going to be coming in and invading, and Paul Revere wants to warn everybody about them. So they set up this plan. They set up a plan where Robert Newman is going to sit up in this tower in the Old North Church. And when he sees the British coming, he's going to light a lamp in the tower. Pretty simple interaction, right? That's his whole job. Now, when that lamp goes off, Paul Revere is going to see that lamp, and he's going to start riding and shouting. And this is going to be meant to notify everybody that the British are coming. Now notice that everybody is not seeing the British, right? Everybody is hearing Paul Revere. Paul Revere, some of the people, they gather into the militia. When they hear him and they start marching, notice that they didn't have to see the British coming. They just had to listen for Paul Revere. Some other people may help prep. Now this is a little bit uh, anachronistic here time-wise, but some people prep by boarding up things and you know fortifying the town a little bit more. And unfortunately, some people run away. So and another anachronism. But the, the idea here is that each of these black lines represents an interaction. We see an interaction between the British coming and the lights in the Old North Church being lit. Lights in the Old North Church being lit, Paul Revere starts riding and yelling. Paul Revere riding and yelling, the militia start marching. Paul Revere riding and yelling, people start fortifying. Paul Revere riding and yelling, some people run away. Make sense? They're each very, very discrete interactions. And each of these interactions has two parts to it. A stimulus, the thing that, interact, that, that causes the uh, reaction, and a response. Sometimes you call it action and reaction. But the idea is that you can define this interaction very simply. And when you combine these, you can get a really interesting set of chain reactions. So in other words, the British are coming, the militia start marching, and there was no direct interaction between those two. There was this chain of events that led to the militia marching. Make sense so far? Now, why do you suppose the militia didn't watch for the British themselves? Any ideas? So, presumably, they're in, they're in a position that they're dispersed. They're, they may be at their homes doing other things at this point. And we don't need to have every single one of them watching for the British, right? By setting things up this way, we can have one person watching for the British. And he sits up there in the tower. Now, why was he up in the tower? Good point of view, right? He can see quite a bit from there. He can see them coming by land, can see them coming by sea. However they end up coming to attack, he can see them and light that lamp. Um, now, the other thing is we couldn't put all these people up in that tower to watch. They just wouldn't fit reasonably. So we separated out our system such that each of these little interactions allows us to notify everybody and get people moving. So when Paul Revere is running around, he's telling every single person who's listening for him. Make sense? Okay, so let's think about this in programming terms a little bit. The most common example you're going to see of this is GUI interactions. So if we have a, a simple little ex example of a graphical user interface with a button, and you press the button, we want something to happen when the button's been pressed. So the button being pressed is a stimulus. We want to assign a response to it. So this particular example doesn't actually do anything yet. So if I just say, run this guy. When I press the button, nothing happens. So what we want to do is assign a response to it. We can do that just like this. And this is a very, very direct way of doing it. I'm going to create a class here that represents the what to do when the button is pressed. This is my response. The button is going to communicate with him using an interface. And we'll talk about this in a little more detail in a minute. So what we're going to do is create an instance of this button report, which says when something happened, print out the button was pressed. And then we're going to create an instance of him and attach him to the button. So we're going to say, Mr. Button, please let me know when the button's pressed. So now when I run this guy, 
I press it and boom, button was pressed. I press it again, boom, button pressed again. And I could keep doing this ad infinitum. Now we're not limited to a single person interested in that interaction. We could set up multiple instances of these. So what I did here is I just modified this button report guy just a little bit here. And I put in a little number so we can keep track of which one's which. And he takes that in his constructor and prints it out when he says the button was pressed. Now what we can do is say, Mr. Button, please notify this guy and notify this guy and notify this guy. And so all of them will get this notification. So when I run this guy here, say press me, I will see that the buttons were pressed. Now notice anything interesting there. The order which they're, they're being notified is the opposite of the order they were added, right? This is something that you really want to pay attention to whenever you're using this pattern. <coughs> Excuse me. Unless the documentation tells you that add action listener will notify in the order they're added, you cannot make any assumptions. And you should not make any assumptions. So in a case like this, all we're saying is, let me know. I don't care when, as long as I know. I don't care what order, as long as I know. And there's no promise of that ordering. Now, how do you think we might be able to set this up so that we fix the ordering, that we ensure a specific ordering? Any ideas? Mm -hmm. Exactly. I could call one thing and have him notify the other three in whatever order he wants to. And that'd be really easy to do here. I can just say button report manager, something like that. And in here, he can say private button report br1 equals new button report one, two, three. And then inside here, he just says br1 dot action performed e br2 and br3, just like that. And then instead of adding three separate like that, I can just say add in the button report manager. And so when I call this, boom, he's going to call it in this specific order. Now, if you wanted to, you could make this thing a little more flexible so that instead of having it hard coded with those three, you could have add and removes in this guy that guarantee when you add, the order in which you add is the order that they're notified. Make sense? So that's something you can do to force the ordering if it's absolutely required. Most of the time you really shouldn't care. Most of the time you just care that you got notified. And each of these guys independently gets their notification. Okay, make sense? Okay, so let's compress this down a little bit because that gets a little bit big. If we're going to only be using one listener, one observer on these things, you don't really need a class, a separate class name. You don't really need a separate class for it. So what we can do is early on in Java, they added these things called anonymous inner classes, and they're pretty ugly. Uh, but the idea here is that instead of creating a separate class with a name on it called button reporter, we're just saying, I want to create a new subclass of action listener or a new implementer of action listener here. And here's the guts right there. And well, actually goes through that guy there. So you can actually code that thing in line. And it's a little bit more compressed. It doesn't take up as much space. And it doesn't pollute your namespace with an extra name that you really didn't need. Okay, make sense there? And if I run this, I'm going to get just that single button was pressed uh, being reported there. Now in Java 8, they added in lambdas. Which make this even more readable. Now we can see that here, we're basically taking that uh, anonymous inner class and compressing it down even further. We're saying, I'm going to implement some interface that this guy's expecting, taking a single argument, and then here's the base, the body of the code. And that's a lot more readable now. It's really just boiling it down to what we care about, the what we want to execute.
Okay. Now, if you're interested more in how lambdas work, I did a talk, uh, I don't know, six months ago or so on lambdas. Um, if you go to javadude.com, you can see the video for that underneath articles. And it goes into a lot of details on how lambdas work. But the thing I want to point out here is that makes things a lot more readable. Okay, questions on that? Okay, let me open this up a little bit more here again. So let's create a little scenario here. That uh, I'm going to have a weather station. Let's say that a teacher has assigned all their students to listen to this weather station, maybe it's a radio station, uh, to find out when the sun rose and when the sun set each day. And then they're going to make a graph over time, things like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to treat this weather station as our source of these events. The source is called an observable. He's the thing that's going to be telling you things. The people who are listening to him are called an observer. So we're going to create our own custom observable situation here. Now the first thing I'm doing is just setting up the weather station as a little GUI here with two buttons, rise and set. Very, very similar to what we did in that other example there. And then I have a school assignment class here that just creates an instance of it. The weather station actually shows the GUI inside its constructor. So when I run this guy, I now see two buttons, sun rose, I press that, it says rose is pressed, sun set, set was pressed. So that's just kind of our setup for this example. We don't have any listeners anywhere other than to the buttons on the inside. What we want to do is create a custom listener so that somebody can listen to the weather station. So when the sun goes up, they get notified. So we're going to create a little chain reaction here. So what we do is in my weather station, what I've done just to help mark things here is I've created two annotations in Java. An annotation is just some metadata you can attach to a class. You can use that to help during compilation. You can use it to help at runtime to find out more information about a class. In this case, I'm just using it as a note. So instead of going to my weather station and putting a comment that says observable, which, you know, who knows, I could misspell it. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm creating this annotation, which I can just attach, and I decided I'm going to make it available at runtime. So it just puts this annotation in the class file so that at runtime you can ask, are you observable? You know, if you cared. So in my weather station class here, Oops. I just threw that little observable tag on there. Totally not needed, but this is part of what I like to do to try to, to get my intent across to people, to describe to them what's going on. And what you could do is in that observable annotation, you could put a comment here saying, see, gang of four, four details on observer pattern. Ah. So you could add in some comments like that so somebody can go there and find out information about what you're thinking. And you have a nice shorthand to describe, here's what this thing is supposed to be doing. And it's a little bit more reliable than comments. Okay. Now, to make something observable, you have three things you need to do. First of all, you need to track the people who are interested in you. These are going to be sun listeners, people who are waiting for the sun to go up and the sun to go down. And sun listener hello, is just a simple interface. He just has whatever methods you want inside of him. People who implement that are the observers. And so I threw this little observer annotation on there. In my weather station, I have to track them. I can put them in a list, I can put them in a tree, whatever kind of structure I want to use to keep track of them. And again, the order of the notification is up to me. If I want to, I could put a little comment on here saying, you know, order, wow, my fingers are not working today, of notification is the same as order of ads. I could do something like that if I wanted to. And now I'm guaranteeing to the outside world that contract. That's part of my contract. You will be notified in the order that you added yourself. This particular example happens to work that way because I add to the list, add, always add at the end of the list, and I always walk the list in order. Okay. But if you don't promise that, people shouldn't make that assumption. Oops. Okay, so first of all, we need to track them. Then we need to have a way for people to register and unregister. 
or at very least register. Sometimes you don't want to let people unregister, but most of the time you want to have both ends of it. And in this case, saying add Sun Listener allows you to add them to the list, and remove Sun Listener allows them to be removed from the list. Finally, we need to notify people when something interesting happens. And that usually just takes the place of walk through this little list and then call one of the methods. Fairly simple, right? Okay. Now, the big advantage we have here is that we, because we're using an interface, don't care who we're talking to. All we care about is that we're notifying somebody who's interested. So anybody can register themselves as long as they implement that interface. And that gives us a lot of flexibility for communication between these two components. And that's one of the things that makes GUIs so easy to implement in Java, is that you can have a button, and that button can do anything. You don't have to subclass the button and make it do special things. You can just attach a listener to it. And that listener gets notified when something interesting happens, in this case, when the button's pressed. Okay. Now, a little note on this, where I'm calling sunrose, you notice how I'm creating a new instance of a calendar every time here. This is something you have to be a little careful about. Depending on the type of object you're creating, you could reuse it. So I could take that, uh, whoops. I could take that uh, calendar and just create a single instance of it and reuse it through the entire loop. The thing you have to be careful of is if that object is mutable, you can get yourself in trouble. Because then one of those listeners could change it, and anybody who happens to be called afterwards could get stung by that change. They'll see the change. And what you really want to do is fix it so that people aren't going to overwrite it. So you want to make sure that that information is, is immutable. Um, so either use some kind of immutable holder for the calendar or use uh, uh, some other way of representing it or create a separate instance each time, which is I'm just going to leave it like that for now. Make sense? Okay, so then when we're doing our button listeners, we're going to chain the interaction here. When the rows button is pressed, call notify sun rows, which in turn is going to notify any listeners that are attached. Similar for set button, call notify sunset, which will notify the listeners at that point. Make sense? So now let's actually create somebody who cares. So here's a student that we're going to have. And all the student's going to do is just write down in his log when the sun rose and when the sun set so that later on he can use that information to create his graph. So each of these students, I'm going to give them a name. Should have made that static. Uh, not like it really matters here. Uh, I'll give him a name. And then when the sun rises, so when he's notified that the sun has risen, he's going to print it out. When he's notified the sun is set, he's going to print that out. And now in the assignment class here, we're going to create instances of each of those students. So we have these uh, Willy, Billy, Silly, and Sally are students. And then we're going to add them to the weather station. So we're going to ask the weather station, please notify me when something interesting happens. In this case, when the sun rises or when the sun sets. Okay, questions on that? Let's run it and see what this one does. So if I run my school assignment, press my sun rose, all four students are now saying, I got that notification. Press my sunset, all four students got that notification. And I could do this as many times as I wanted to, and they get, inf they get the information. Now, right now, they all happen to be getting the same timings. Sometimes they won't. I'm probably not going to hit it. I have to hit it just, just at the right amount of time to get them to be a little different. But they could, because they're getting different instances of the calendar, they could be getting separate times for those. Okay, make sense? So that's a very basic interaction between an observable, the thing that you want to listen to, and the observer, the thing who's doing the listening. And it's very decoupled. You can add in anything you want. I could in this code throw in weather station dot add sun listener, new sun listener, and actually just code this in line with an anonymous center class. Something like that. And then when I run that, boom, I see that extra listener called. And one thing that's very, very nice about this is that this kind of interaction is very amenable to modifications at runtime. 
So somebody could write code at runtime that attaches new listeners. Think about Eclipse, this development environment that I'm in here. You drop in a new plugin. When that plugin's activated, it can add in actions into the user interface. It can tell toolbars, I want new icons on the top there. It can say, when the run button is pressed, provide a new action for running. It's very extensible that way. Uh, if you had a GUI where there's different pages, you could have different pages do different reactions for a next and a previous button, perhaps. So it's very flexible at runtime as opposed to hardwiring things. And the more you hardwire what to do, the less interaction you actually can have. Now let's think for a minute about this edit. Uh, let's see, is that the, the find underneath there? Yeah, edit, find, find and find replace. Let's think about how that interaction might work. If we had a, let me create a untitled text file. If we had this thing really hardwired, so we could say when find pressed, we could do something like, uh, whoops, ah, come on. Ask user for text to find, uh, wait for button press, look up text, highlight text, close dialog. So we could do something like that, right? It could be a very basic interaction. But think about what this is going to do for a second. Maybe I wanted to, uh, to use an editor where somebody did this. And I've got a bunch of text on the screen. And I hit Control F to find something. And maybe I'm trying to find humu humu nuku nuku wapu wa -ah. And that's a lot to type. And I'm lazy. And I happen to notice that somewhere on the screen, I see humu humu nuku nuku wapu wa -ah. So I go over there and I double click on it to highlight the word, right? And I want to copy it and paste it into my find dialog. What happens when I double click on humu humu nuku nuku wapu wa -ah? Any ideas? I hear the familiar ding and nothing happens. Well, it should be ding ding because I clicked twice, right? Why did nothing happen? Why can't I click on this text behind that dialog? So we're in a situation here where we have a modal dialog. When this dialog gets printed up, we have a straight line of stuff to do. We have now dropped into a mode. We have dropped into a subsequence of events here, a subsequence of code. And that dialog is blocking all input to anything else in the user interface. So I can't double click on the humu humu nuku Humu humu nuku nuku wapu wa I knew I was going to mess it up at some point. I can't click on it. So I have to close the dialog, go back, double click on it, copy, open the dialog again, paste, and at that point I'm sick of this editor. So a better way to do this is if we break this down into discrete interactions. What should happen when find is pressed? Or the user hits control F. What should, our, what should our editor do? What's that? How does it ask the user for text? Shows a dialog. Boom. Not how dialog, show dialog. Boom, end of interaction. And that dialog, we mark it as non-modal. So you can interact with the dialog, or you can still interact with the text editor. Okay. Now, what do we do? when X is pressed in the dialog in the upper corner. So when you go up and press this little guy up in here, what happens to the dialog? Boom, we dismiss it. Boom, end of interaction. What do we do when cancel is pressed in the dialog? Same thing, dismiss the dialog. Okay, what do we do when find is pressed in the dialog? And now you also have a choice on this closed dialog. We could have that be part of the find, right? 
or we could just leave the dialog up there which allows you to hit find next find next find next find next find next let's see how whoops see how each of these interactions is now very very simple easy to deal with easy to code and we get a nice benefit out of this that now the user interface is much more interactive it's much more up to the user to decide how they want to interact with the GUI. The user can use the find dialog multiple times in a row. The user can highlight text that they normally couldn't have gotten to before because we were in a modal situation. Much, much, much friendlier. Make sense? So now, let's see what happens with that uh, student example. If, let's see, where was I? I was in the student, I think. Yeah. Let's say that we want the students to only be notified once. If we, the student wants to be notified once, as soon as he's notified, he wants to ask the weather station to remove him so that he won't be notified again. Sounds reasonable, right? So what we might do is we might code our student where we take in a weather station as one of his constructor arguments. And then when sun rose or sunset is called, he says, if I was past a weather station, remove me. And does the same thing in both of those. Sounds reasonable enough, right? Let's see what happens when we run this. Well, it's just a slight modification. The only change here in the, in the school assignment was that I added in the weather stations there. So let's run this. And I'm gonna hit sun rose and kaboom! we get concurrent modification exception. Now this is very dependent on the type of data structure you're using to store, but in most cases this can cause you some problems if you're not careful in your coding. And what's going on here is that in my weather station, I'm walking through my listener list here, right? And inside of one of these methods that gets called, I'm modifying that list. And this is what Java's complaining about. Anytime you get an, it, get an iterator to something to walk through it, if you make a modification and then that iterator is asked for something else, he says, hey, nope, I'm done. You tweaked me while I was walking through the list. That's not allowed here. Now, if you used a different data structure, you wouldn't have to worry about that, right? But you still have the potential of what if the next thing I was going to look at got removed? Where do I go next? My next pointer might be blown away if I was using a linked list. So you got to be careful about things like this. There's a couple nice ways around this. Easiest way is to make a copy of the list of your targets. So what I'm going to do, oh, and I actually made a mistake in this one I just noticed. What we're going to do is we're going to synchronize based on our sun listeners so that nobody can add and remove at the same time. And the mistake I made is I forgot to do this up here as well. So that if we're in the middle of copying the list, the add is blocked until we release the lock down here. And vice versa, if we're adding, this copy of the targets is blocked until the add or the remove is done. So this prevents multiple threads from interacting with us at the same time, as well as because we have a copy of the list, we're not going to have a problem with them removing from the main list of things because the copy is unaffected and we're actually walking the copy. So if, when we decide we're going to notify Sunrose, at that point it's locked in stone who we're going to notify. And then any of them that do the removes, it'll affect the next iteration of it. So if I run this guy now, Boom, we get sunrose. If I press sunset, two of them got notified because I had two of them pass in a null and two of them were actually getting the notifications. So you'll notice that uh, Willie and Silly are no longer being notified. They got removed from the list. But everything worked just fine. And now if I... Oops, that's the wrong one. <laughs> How many of these do I have running here? So now if I press sunrose, that's an old one as well. 
Let me run him again. So the first time, I hit Sunrose. All are notified. Second time I hit it, only uh, Billy and Sally are being notified. Make sense? Okay. So that's some common use of doing an observer yourself. It's fairly easy to set up, but there are a couple little issues you got to watch out for. So now let's see a place where these are actually used. We're going to create something called a Java bean. And uh, back in Java 1.1, I think, is around the time that, that uh, Sun introduced Java beans in the language. And these were a really cool little idea. The idea was that we can use some common conventions, getter and setter methods, for example, the observer pattern, and use these to help figure out things about a, a class. So if we define a class like this, call a class called person, we have some data in it, name, address, and age, but we add in some getters and setters. These are public methods, right? People on the outside can see and use these. If we use some smart naming conventions, we can have people on the outside know something about what we're doing here. So if we take a look at this, we have get name and set name, and we follow these naming conventions where you have public, some type, get some name. This defines what we call a readable property. If we have public void set some name, passing in some type with a value, that defines a writable property. If you have both, it's readable and writable. This was originally intended for when you uh, used a Java bean builder. So you could drag and drop things to create a GUI on the screen. But you can also use it for a bunch of other things. With properties, the first thing that it lets you do, where's my properties? Is you can have this little property sheet here. And as you click on objects here, you'll notice that, that the property sheet is changing its contents based on what is being clicked here. Now Eclipse does it a little bit differently, but the basic idea in the Java Bean Builders was when you click on a class, let's say you drop an instance of a class on your, on your GUI area that you're building, maybe it's a button. You click on that button. We can ask the button what properties it has just by looking at its getters and setters. And in this case, we say, hey, I have a property called name. So I can put name down here in my property sheet. And then I can turn around and call get name and put his value over here. And then guess what happens if the user edits that value? I can turn around and call set name, right? That's pretty nice interaction. It makes it completely dynamic just based on a naming convention. Now they also let you do something called defining a bean info file, which gave you a little bit more descriptive name on things. Like you see here, it says last space modified. I can't normally do that just by looking at a name here because there's no spaces. So the bean info might say, you know, use last modified as the display name of this property. So you could add in extra information, but you didn't need to. You could take any class, drop it into that bean builder, and poof, it appears in your property sheet, and you can edit it. And that was pretty neat. So then you could take that stuff that you edited and you could save it to the disk in a serialized format and then reread it, unserializing it, and it all works. Pretty neat idea. Now over the years, it modified quite a bit. Instead of people using the serialization scheme, what they did is they generated code. So instead of having the GUI actually be live on the screen, they had a model running that represented the GUI. And it kind of went away from the original intent of Java Beans, but you can still use this information in other types of tools, uh, especially when you look at things like um, if you're using Java server pages or uh, some other little languages that give you a, a dot notation for properties. I could say scott.name instead of scott.getName, open paren, close paren. And then that little language could figure out that I meant to call the get method. Or if I say scott.name equals foo, I meant to call the set method. So you can do some neat things with that. So I'm defining these little read-write properties. Pretty simple. Here's a little sample app that I've written here. Create your class, call the setters. Hey, that's pretty straightforward, right? 
nothing magical there. It's stuff you already do. So now what we're going to do is implement something called bound properties. And a bound property is one that will notify you when it changes. And this is where it gets really useful. What we're going to do is implement a observer pattern here where the person is observable and you're adding in a property change listener, which is an interface that they define to let people know when a property value has changed. You're going to do those three things, keep track of things, allow people to add and remove and fire changes. And then in our setters, we're going to have some code that looks like this every time. Grab the old value, change the value, and then report what the old value and the new value were. So this way people can attach property change listeners and say when something changes, let me know about it. Now this is really great if you want to keep a model and a GUI in sync. You can add listeners to your model and whenever a property changes, update a field on the screen. Whenever something types something on the screen, we update the model. And guess what happens if you have somebody else listening to that. You type something on the screen, update the, the model, the model then notifies everybody, and they update things on the screen. We're going to see where this is very useful when we talk about model view controller. I think it's in the next session. So we use this type of pattern, grab the old value, change the value, fire the property change, for each of these guys. And in our person sample, what I'm going to do here is try to set, try to use this so I can sync up the addresses of two people. So let's say that these two people live together. And whenever one moves, I want to automatically update the address of the other one. So I'm doing that whenever one moves logic. Let me just write this so it's a little bit more readable. I implement that by saying, hey, Mike, let me know whenever one of these change events happens. And I'm going to say if the address equals the property name being passed in, then tell Sue to set her address to your address. And then down here, vice versa. Whenever Sue's address changes, set the address of Mike. Sounds pretty reasonable, right? So then I'm going to say, Mike, set your address. And let's see what happens when I run it. Anybody, anybody have any guesses at what might happen here? Well, let's find out. Run as Java application. Kaboom! Hmm. 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 My finger's getting tired of scrolling here. And there we go. Oh, a Stack Overflow error. What happened? Yep, when you change one, the other one fires off, which causes the first one to change, which causes the second one to change, which causes the first one to change. Eww. Not a good way to do things here, right? Well, we can fix that. What we can do is add in a little logic to say, if the value didn't really change, don't fire an event. And that seems pretty reasonable, doesn't it? So we go up into our little fire property change method here, and I'm going to say, if the old value was null, you know, if the old value is null, always fire the event. Now, that will actually be a problem with this code if the new value is null as well, because then you'll get your infinite cycle. But I'm going to wave my hand at that for the moment and say, let's not worry about that. Um, if the old value is not equal to the new value, go ahead and fire your change. Okay. We could extend the logic in here saying if the old value is null and the new value is not null, fire it. Else, if the new value is null and the old value is not null, fire it. Else, if the values are different. So we could have put that logic in. I just wanted to keep it a little bit simpler for the example. So this will fire the change only when the value really changes. So now when I run my person sample, I'll see that at the end of this, both of their addresses have been changed. And the only one that I explicitly called out was Mike. So this gives you an idea how, of some of the synchronization type of capabilities you can get out of this. And this is something you do very commonly if you have some kind of graphical user interface, where you have the model and you have the little GUI component, and you have them listen to each other to keep themselves in sync. Make sense?
Okay. Now there is something because these property changes were so common. We'll see that this code here you're going to have in pretty much every one of your Java beans. They came up with a little helper class. Whoops. And this guy here is called property change support. And property change support manages the list of listeners for you and does the firing of the property changes for you. So what I've done is I'm creating an instance of this property change support and I'm passing myself into it. And what that does, that allows him to fire events with the source of the event being me, the person instance, and not the property change support instance. Because when I, uh, let me pop this back to here. When I was doing this by hand, I was creating this property change event, passing myself in saying, I am the source of the event in case anybody cares. Because somebody else is, do, is actually firing that on our behalf, we have to tell them who the source should be. And then I'm doing some delegation here. I'm saying my add and remove methods have property change support do the work for me. Now notice that I have four of them here. I have the two that I had before, which just take the property change listener. But then I have these two extra ones, which allow you to specify which property you're interested in, which in our example is actually a really good thing. We can simplify the example a little bit more by passing in address and not have to do that extra check to see if address was the property that changed. And then when we're doing our fire property change, we just ask property change support to do it. Now, million dollar question here. I'm delegating these four methods to property change support and I'm calling property change support itself. Why can't I or why shouldn't I just say extends property change support and then get rid of all this code here and just call my inherited method. And that'll work just fine. Oh, I need my constructor. That's not right. Now that's interesting. That used to work. Now I'm thinking that's not possible. Well, let's, let's pretend for a minute that that was possible. Why would this be a bad idea anyway? Now it saved me a bunch of code, right? Because instead of delegating everything, I'm just calling all those superclass methods. I'm just inheriting those public methods. But why might this be a bad idea? This property change supports a pretty useful helper class. What am I saying when I say person extends property change support? We're saying person is a property change support, right? That doesn't feel right, does it? That's the first problem. Modeling wise, property change support is not a noun concept, right? He's, he's a utility, he's a helper. He's helping us to implement something. That's the first problem, is it doesn't feel or smell right. Okay. Second problem, what if I wanted to implement something? What if I wanted to extend something else? I can't now, right? I'm locked in. I have a superclass taken up and I only get one superclass in Java. Third problem, now that I've said I extend property change support, anybody external to me can use me wherever a property change support might be needed. And this is one of those things you have to be careful of. If we remember what the student looked like. This guy here, he says he implements Sun Listener. Maybe that's not such a great idea because now I can use this student anywhere a Sun Listener is needed. Maybe that's my intent. If it is, then that's great, right? But maybe my intent was only in certain scenarios I want to use the student as a sun listener. So maybe what he should have had is an inner class that implements the sun listener and adds that instead of adding the whole student overall. So be careful what you're meaning 
is on things, especially with property change support. This guy, and that used to work, and I'm guessing that they locked that down later on. Um, they used to, to have a, uh, I believe they didn't have a constructor that had him in there. Um, but if this were possible, it still smells bad. You're giving it, you're giving this uh, information about I am a property change support, and people can use it other places. What we really want to do is just take advantage of his support for us, and so that's why we keep it like that. Okay, and uh, did I change something else? Okay, there we go. So now when I run this guy. I get the same results, and I can simplify things a little bit. Kind of like that. So now I can just say, only notify me when the address changes and the property change support helps me out there, he does that check for me instead of us having to do the check. So that's a much more simpler code now. Make sense? Okay, so that's the basic idea behind a Java Bean and some of the things you can do with it. Um, there are other things you can do with it that uh, I'm not a big fan of. There's an idea of constrained properties and constrained properties, they, they notify you before they change. And then the listeners can veto by throwing an exception. And this sounded like a good way to do validation up front. You can just plug in whatever validators you want as vetoable change listeners. And if they don't like the new value, they just throw a vetoable change exception or property veto exception. The problem there is now you've lost the actual value. You called the set, and then the value doesn't actually get set. So a better way to do validation in general is let the model contain the values, but mark it invalid and keep track of why things are invalid. So that's something else you can do. Uh, and then the other thing you can do with these is if you have more generic um, I'm going to call them events that you want to fire. So anything other than property change support, you can set up listeners like we did to the sun listener, for example. And that's something that could be used in a GUI builder as well. It gives you the ability to right click on a little bean on the, on the screen. Like let's say it's a person. You can right click on him and any events that were set up. So let's say he had a sun listener. We could say when sun rose, because he can just look and say, oh, I see an add something, something and remove something something and these are event listener interfaces and based on that I can just pull out the method names sun rose and sunset and allow the user to right click and say when sun rose do something when sunset do something and it can generate listeners for you so that was another thing why, what they were trying to do with java beans again leveraging these existing patterns like the, like the observer pattern um, we don't use that all that much anymore, but it was really neat for a little while. And uh, one of the tools that implemented it really well was Visual Age for Java, which was a precursor to Eclipse. Um, and then after all that's taken out, any other public methods are just called methods. Those are actions you can run. You could right click on the person when sun rose, go over to another bean and say, call this method. And poof, you can get nice chain reactions and everything. Really neat things. Okay. And. That is really all I have for this. Any questions on anything? Hopefully this was helpful. And uh, the patterns get a little bit more complex over time. This is one of the simpler ones. But this one's a real key for some of the later patterns, especially for next week when we talk about uh, Model View Controller. But not next week, next month. Okay, question? So what's a good way to observe collections? Um, well, first of all, the base collections don't have any type of observable mechanism in them. Now, there's a couple little tricks you can do. Nope, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> 
And what I tend to do with collections well, let's make it a list instead of just a general collection. Just, just so we have something a little more concrete right now. And I'm going to make this guy implement list. Now what I like to do is I, I use the use um, the decorator pattern quite a bit. And we're going to talk about that later on down the line, but this is going to be a quick example of a decorator. And the idea here is that we're going to put a wrapper around something. So when you talk to it, all the calls go through that wrapper. And this gives you control of all those calls. Now it doesn't give you control of method to method calls within the wrapped object, but any external calls will be tracked. So if I did this, let's say I had a private list real list, create a constructor for him, generate delegates. So now what we have here the heck is that? It's a Java 8 thing that I don't think they got quite right in Eclipse. Okay, and I missed this one. So what we're doing here, first of all, is wrapping up all the methods so that when somebody calls a method on this wrapper, we pass it through to the real list. Then we take a look for the places that actually do changes. So things like adds and sets and removes. And then what we can do is add in a private, I'm just going to go ahead and use property change support on this guy. And then we're going to Let's delegate him as well. And let's take a look at where these things can change. Um, there's a couple things depending on it. Some of the iterators can actually change things. So what we'd want to do here is instead of returning the real iterator, return a wrapper for the iterator that can track the changes as well. I don't know if I'm going to have time to show you that, but um, this is one of the things you've got to be careful with decorators. Sometimes you have to have nested decorators returned. Um, so add and remove are going to be the first cases of this. So we might do something like this to say the list property has changed. So basically the whole thing has changed. And I'm going to pass in a null for the old value saying, you know, we really don't care about the old value. And then the current object for the new value. Um, if you did want to care about the old value, then we'd have to make a copy of the list at the beginning of this before we actually do the add. But normally when I do changes on lists or collections, I don't like to make a copy of the list. Most of the time, people really don't care what the old value is. But you just want to make sure you put a dot, put a documentation on that saying you, you know, they'll always be null for the old values. And then we'll do something similar for this guy. And so on and so on. And then what you can do when you actually write the use of this So let's say that I said, oh, you know, actually, let's not pass that in as a constructor parameter. Let's just actually just create the observable list and hide it completely under the covers. That way no one will really have a handle to it. Ah, come on. 
There we go, that's what I want. And then in here, I can say observable list wrapper. And then I can say list.add Scott, Steve, Mike. And maybe before that, I can say list.add property change listener. Okay, that looks good there. And then when I run this, I should see changed happening uh, three times there. There we go, something like that. So that's a way that you can make a list observable. Um, we just threw a little decorator around it and took it use, you know. Now you have to make sure you do it in all the places that it actually is going to change. And the reason I was calling out iterator on that is that the iterator class has a remove method in it. And so we got to make sure that we wrap it as well. And so you would just say, instead of returning realist iterator, return new iterator wrapper, passing in the thing that we want to report the changes on, so me, and the actual iterator itself that's created. And uh, very similar. Um, some of these can get pretty hairy because some of these collections, you got to be pay really close attention to what actually changes what's under the covers. Um, but they can be very, very useful, and I've done this a few times. Okay, make some sense. Any other questions there? And the the um, the level of detail, instead of using a property change support, which in this case I'm just saying the list has changed, you could have a a, a more specific type of listener there. You could have a, a list change listener that you define yourself that might say it might have several methods. It might have a node added, node removed. Um, data changed, you know, for different slots in it, and you could be more specific on the type of change that happened. You know, from the add method you call added, from the remove method you call remove, that type of thing. Okay, makes sense? Any questions? Okay, so the next session will be uh, the third Thursday of June, and that will be on Model View Controller. So thanks for coming. I will be posting the video that I've recorded here, and uh, that will be on javadude.com underneath the articles section. And I should have that up in the next day or two. Okay, have a great day. Thanks for coming.